Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you very much for coming to our fifth talk of the term. Tonight, I am extremely pleased to welcome Professor Sajjan Pendry, uh, founding father of the physics and metamaterials. Um, he was educated here at Downing College, and he's now a professor at Imperial College. Um, already at the PhD level, he was making breakthroughs and very really important discoveries, and hasn't stopped since. Um, I'm honestly a very many honors that he has received up until now. He was uh, made a fellow of the Royal Society in 1984. He won the Dirac Prize in 1996. He was knighted in 2004. And this year, he won the very prestigious Cavie Prize. Uh, I hope you are as psyched as I am. Uh, and uh, please welcome Professor Sajjan Pendry. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for that very kind welcome. It's a pleasure to be back in my old home, Cambridge. It's a pleasure to be back a second time because I was in this lecture theatre last month talking about uh, something quite different. We're we'll talking about cloaking on that occasion. But this is going to be quite a different talk. Um, <clears throat> we've developed some uh, new mathematics, uh, physics mathematics, which uh, enables us to control light uh, on a, an unprecedented scale. Of course, Maxwell's equations tell you how light behaves, um, but they, they are not as intuitive as, as they might be. I, I challenge you to stare at the four equations which uh, Maxwell uh, wrote down 150 years ago. It's this anniversary, by the way, and uh, there's been a series of lectures at King's College. Although Maxwell was the first Cavendish professor, he didn't actually write his equations. He, he wrote them down the road from me in King's College, uh, London. And actually, uh, he, he um, read, his, read his, his thesis to the uh, Royal Institution in December 150 years ago. And there will be a reenactment of that event at the Royal Institution at the beginning of December. And I was privileged to give one of the lectures which uh, were, were held every month to honour this 150th anniversary. Nevertheless, great fan and admirer as Maxwell as I am, I challenge anybody to stare at his equations and imagine how light might refract as an interface. Do you think you could do that? Maybe some of you are very, very gifted and can. I, I can't. Uh, so the tools which we've developed uh, are exact at the level of Maxwell's equations, but they give an intuitive way of expressing uh, the consequences of equations, which enables you to uh, use them as a thinking tool as well as a tool for calculation. Now, why are we interested in the nanometer control of light? Um, actually, uh, I... I hate these big barriers between me and the audience. I come down there, sort of amongst you, and I can see the screen there. So, um, well, for a start, you use light to see small objects. And the microscope, for many years, was the thing you used when you wanted to see really small objects. This thing's resonating. Put it further down. Um, but this uh, last century, the microscope sort of ran out of road because it can only see things which are of the order of the wavelengths of light. And this restriction was discovered by Abbe um, in, sorry, that should be 1870, <laughs> 1873. Um, and so that limited about 500 nanometers to what light can see, and that's a real bugger when it comes to doing uh, bio, biosciences, because that's where the cell starts to be interesting. And if you want to look at the contents of the cell, you can't with a conventional microscope. Now, you may be aware there's a Nobel Prize in chemistry this year uh, for developing a microscope that could see nanometer objects. And uh, that, that's a story I shan't tell tonight, but Stephen Hell got the, the prize for that. So it, it's a very important thing to be able to see inside the cell. And to do that, you need to see something which is a few nanometers across. Uh, of course, the, inter the innards of your cell phones, the circuits in there, are now designed on the scale of tens of nanometers, and, and they're, they're built with light, but very unconventional sort of lenses and uh, optical processors are used to do that. A conventional microscope would stand no chance of even seeing what's in your cell phone, let alone manufacturing it. And here's another one. 
And there's this sort of conversation between a mouse and an elephant when you try to detect a molecule with light. Because if you can only focus light down to uh, 500 nanometers square, and you try to hit a molecule with that light, the molecules are typically one nanometer square, and, and you're out by almost a factor of a million in, in where the light's going, or the thing it wants to hit, you know, it's like the tiniest dartboard in the world. And if you could actually squeeze that light into a square nanometer, then you, every photon, pretty much, would stand a good chance of actually hitting that molecule and giving an excitation. So single molecule sensitivity or spectroscopy is something which you could do if you could get down to this nanometer scale, and I believe we can. Um, now, another thing about light is that if I shine this laser beam around the room, it doesn't care that there are other photons buzzing around all the time. It completely ignores them. And that's a great quality of light if you want to point to the laser pointer, or I want to see you because your image isn't distorted because your light isn't <laughs> being scattered by all the other light. But it's a real problem if you want to do something like switching. So the uh, communications are, are on the internet are carried by optical fibers, and you want to route those fibers from the server to your laptop. And along the way, they have to be switched. Um, it would be nice if you could switch, if you could use light to switch light. And at the moment, you, what you mainly do is to turn the light into electrons. The electrons do the switching, of course, electrons are charged, they interact with one another like hell, and then you turn it back into light again. And that's sort of inefficient. You can currently switch light with light, but it's a very clumsy, <coughs> clumsy process. But if you could make a really, really strong concentration of light, and you can now with very, very powerful lasers, but supposing that you only had a little bit of power to spare, uh, what would you do? Instead of squashing it into 500 nanometers squared, if you could squash it into one nanometer squared, you could use quite modest power, and at the same time, you could get very high energy density, and that's what you need to force one photon to see another photon. And then you could switch light with light, and that would be the first thing you do, and then you might get even more ambitious and start making a computer with light, if you could get photons to talk to one another. And then there are all sorts of clever tricks which you can do, like time-reversing light. It is possible to devise a really strange mirror, which uh, instead of reflecting, you know the laws of uh, reflection that you come off and you make the same angle the other side of the normal as does, uh, as does the incident light. Um, well, in... There we go. And in, in, in a time-reversed light, if I shone this laser on a, um, a time-reversing mirror, it would send the light exactly back to where it came from. And uh, that, for that, you need, again, non-linear effects and very, very strong concentrations of, of, of light. Um, and you need powerful lasers at the moment to do that. So one of the things it's used for is... Um, well, suppose you're a, a military man and you want to shoot down a satellite, for example. Uh, <clears throat> the difficulty is that if your laser is ground-based, it has to travel through the atmosphere. And the atmosphere <clears throat> has a little bit of turbulence in it, so uh, if you <coughs> go outside at night, and it's a clear night, you see the stars twinkling, and that's because they move their position in the sky because they're coming through this, this crinkling atmosphere. And the same happens to a laser beam you're trying to hit a satellite that it dances all over the place. All right. And so the chances of it hitting and knocking out the satellite are quite small. So what the plan is that you, you do that. And some of the laser light hits the satellite. It's reflected back and you, 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 you see it with a telescope. And then you time reverse it. Okay. And then you amplify it, and you amplify it, and you amplify it, so it's really, really powerful. And now, because it's time reversed, it knows exactly the wiggly trajectory that it came to you from the satellite form. And so it zooms back out, that same trajectory, bang, it hits the satellite. The more peaceful things you might want to do with it, but that's not the theme of my lecture tonight. And it's a problem because 
of the wavelength of light restrict conventional objects in, in, in what they can do for you. So um, I want to talk a little bit about how we control light at present. And surprisingly, uh, this, this man's law is still around. Um, it was also invented at the same time by Descartes. Um, uh, of course, in, here in the English-speaking world, we call it Snell's Law. Uh, but when I'm giving lectures in France, I delete this one and call it Descartes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, of course, he really did think of it about the same time. Um, and you can say all sorts of things about Descartes' Law. It, 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 it sort of works on the assumption that light is a stream of particles and it knows nothing about the wave nature of light, so um, everything in Snell's law has to be much bigger than the wavelength, otherwise you get diffraction as well as refraction. It doesn't know about the fact that light reflects from the surface, so all kinds of things uh, that are unsatisfactory about it. So, but we use it still to design scientific equipment, and the reason is that you have this very physical picture in your mind. So if you alter the curvature of that surface or move this element there or wherever, you can already see, before you do any detailed calculations, just how qualitative what you're doing might alter the situation. And if you want to design a completely new bit of kit, you can dream it up in your head with this picture that Snell gave us of rays refracting at surfaces. And so it's really survived a, a long time simply because uh, it, uh, it, it's power, the power that it gives to our imaginations. But it won't do for sub nanometer light. It won't even do for light which is 500 nanometers across because you'll already be very much aware that you have a wave and not a particle there. So we, we have to do something different. We have to appeal to Maxwell's equations. And Maxwell's equations work in terms of the components of light, which are the electric and magnetic fields. Um, now, the first law on which the uh, movement of light is based was found by Michael Faraday. And he showed that, um, well, first of all, he made a very important contribution to mathematical physics, even though he knew very little mathematics. He was almost completely untutored uh, as, as a child, and um, he, he, he learned, learned all this science on the fly. But he was such a brilliant man that uh, he, he, he had influence in, in many fields of science, uh, physics, of course, uh, and, and chemistry. Um, and the way he described a magnetic field was different from the way to be described Previously, at that time, people thought of forces as acting at a distance. So Newton, for example, when he described the, the gravitational force, uh, described uh, a force which acted between object A and object B, and was proportional, uh, inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. And similarly, people thought of the interaction of two magnetic poles as action at a distance. Um, and what was in between was nothing. It was vacuum, for example, and, and the force still acted. But Faraday ha had a different picture, which on the face of it, you might say, well, it's, it's illogical, because usually when you do some science and you have to make some assumptions, you use something called Occam's razor, which says, the, the assumptions you make are the simplest necessary to get where you want to go. I didn't do that. What he did was to say, well, uh, the force is mediated by something called a field. The, the first magnet creates a field, and it's the field which then acts on the second magnet. And it's this concept of a field, which at this stage seemed purely extraneous. <coughs> that was Faraday's great uh, contribution, uh, because now nowadays uh, much of modern physics is formulated in terms of field theory, and it was Faraday who introduced this concept of, of, of field, and he he 
it could demonstrate the real reality of this field. I'm sure many of you have seen this experiment done. If you take a bar magnet and you put a piece of paper over it, and then you scatter iron filings, they will align themselves along Faraday's field lines. So you can actually see them or reveal them with, uh, with this experiment with the, the iron filings. Now, he formulated his laws of magnetic induction using this concept of a field. So he imagined that the magnet, uh, well, or postulated the magnet was surrounded by this field, and if, if you just had the magnet sitting there uh, in this coil of wire, then nothing happened. But if you move the magnet, he then saw a current in this galvanometer here. And he, his law said that the, the induced electromotive force was proportional to the rate at which these magnetic lines cut that wire. So it was the change in the magnetic field that produced the electric field, which in turn generated the current. And Maxwell, who uh, at that time was just down the road from the Royal Institution where Faraday worked, and a great friend of uh, Faraday's, Maxwell was much the younger man, by the way, uh, um, and in contrast to Faraday, who had a very poor background, his father was a blacksmith, uh, Maxwell was son of a laird, a very rich man, um, and he had a, 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 a gilded childhood as a mathematical genius. He went to university at age 13 or something ridiculous, uh, senior wrangler at Trinity or whatever, what have you. And he formulated Maxwell, uh, Faraday's law of induction uh, mathematically in this way. He didn't write it this way because this symbol hadn't been invented at that time. So his equations were very long-winded. But essentially what this equation says is that if, if you change a magnetic field with time, you create an electric field. But he also, his key contribution to these equations, this comes from Faraday, his key contribution was to realize that there had to be some symmetry in these equations, and that conversely, if you change an electric field, here we call it the D field, then you get a magnetic field. And, and that's the way light works, that a changing magnetic field makes an electric field which changes and makes a, a magnetic field. And so light is a sort of dance between the electric and magnetic fields, and you can think of the, the beat of the dance as being what's called the frequency of the light, and the step of the dance as being the wavelength. And at that time, it was not known that light consisted of electric and magnetic fields dancing in this way. And um, at that time, um, electricity and magnetism were two separate disciplines. You studied electricity uh, by uh, doing electrostatic experiments. Maybe some of you have seen a Wimshurst machine in which you create you know, sparks and so on and so forth. And then there's another sort of electricity <coughs> which you generated using gal uh, galvanic cells and which was used to create magnetism by passing it through coils and so on. And they were the, 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 the two electricities were measured in different units, so there's stack bolts and there's magnetic bolts. And what Maxwell realized was that the ratio of these two units, which collided in these equations here, uh, was the velocity of light. And so he set out to measure the velocity of light and when I was a, a student in the Cavendish, one of the experiments you could do, which we call Searle's dustbin, was a, a way of turning static electricity into magnetic e electricity. And this was done by uh, charging a huge capacitor, which was a, a, a huge brass cylinder which uh, Searle had built many years ago, and uh, which you could calculate capacitance fairly exactly because of the cylindrical geometry. And if you charge this capacitor and then discharge it and charge it and discharge it, it produced a current. So a static charge, which was when the capacitor was charged, was discharged and produced a current, which you could measure magnetically. So he could measure the ratio between stat bolts and magnetic bolts. And imagine his excitement when he did that. 
And the velocity got corresponded to the known velocity of light within a few percent. It was the greatest, re greatest unification theory ever, I think. Never, never mind all the ones we've seen in the 20th century. Quite remarkable. Um, so these are his equations, but as I remarked before, they're not the most transparent things in the world, all right? I know they're on T-shirts and things like that, but just staring at them will not tell you what Snell's law is <clears throat> to do some more work. Now, another man who's part of the, my story is Albert Einstein. And what he uh, did was a, a little bit like Michael Faraday, so um, only Einstein turned his attention to Newton, and Newton said that planets interact with the sun at a distance, and this is a inverse square law, just as it was between two magnetic poles. <coughs> but Einstein said, no, that's not right, and that space isn't empty, space is stuff, just as a piece of glass is a material, a piece of rubber is a material, what have you, so space is a material. And furthermore, it has properties, like its geometry. And Einstein said that, just as Faraday had said, that the magnetic force acts by an intermediary, which is the field, Einstein said there is a field surrounding gravitational objects, such as the sun. And that is described by the metric, and what he meant by the metric was the extent to which that heavy object crushes space. So space isn't nothing anymore, it's something which has a property which can be changed by ma ma massive objects. They have to be very massive, and even the squeezing which the sun does is quite modest. And moving through this squeezed space, uh, a planet uh, naturally moves in, in, in a curved line. And so it's this indirect effect that space is altered, therefore the planet doesn't move in a straight line anymore, it goes around in a curve. Now, one consequence of that was that um, although light is known to be massless, it does move through space. And Newton's law only works, operates on massive objects because the force is proportional to the product of the masses. Okay. Um, but light is massless, so it shouldn't bother about gravity. But if you take Einstein's view, uh, light has to, be, has to care about the space, it, space it's move, moving through. And if it moves through a curved space, it will follow a curved trajectory. And that was his prediction. In fact, if you look at Maxwell's equations and rewrite them and, and put into the equations the fact that space is curved, through Einstein's metric, what you find is, is that the metric sits there in just the same place that the refractive index would. So the sun, because it curves space and changes the metric, acts like a lens. And so it will deviate starlight. And that was one prediction which Einstein made. And in 1919, Arthur Stanley Eddington, who was Plumian professor here in Cambridge, Plumian professor of astronomy, uh, made that measurement. It was, in fact, it did have some significance because, outside of science, because both Einstein and Eddington were uh, objected to the war. Uh, Einstein, uh, uh, Eddington was a Quaker, and he was a conscientious objector during the First World War. And as well as being an experiment to test Einstein's theory, Eddington very much saw this as a reconciliation between the two cultures of Germany and uh, United Kingdom. Uh, two observations were made. They had to be made at the time of the eclipse because you can't see stars near the sun uh, until there's an eclipse. The sun is just too bright and you, you can't see them. And there were two observations made, one in Africa and one in South America. One of them was failed because of the cloud, but, but one of them uh, gave a result, and it confirmed Einstein's theory. That, that was published in the Times. It was uh, the only scientific paper ever published in the Times, and it created an absolute sensation because it rocked the whole foundation of Victorian science. The space was empty, and uh, it, uh, um, 
it, it changed everything, as they say. Um, so we're going to pick up on that idea that space is made of rubber. And um, what's next? Yes, OK. So we're going to use that to create this, this new way of looking at uh, how light moves called transmission optics. And this, this is what Snell's law does. Um, and this is what we want to do to go beyond the ray of approximation. Um, now, the thing is that the great thing that Snell gave us was this picture of light moving as a stream of particles. And you, you, you can imagine, you know how particles move. And he gave us this law of refraction and so on and so forth. So you, you have this picture in your head. But Faraday also gave us a picture. And it is related to streams of particles. But instead of streams of particles, we have streams of fields, which are represented by field lines, which uh, only begin and end on uh, electrical charges or, or, or magnetic poles, depending on scale magnetism. And so we're going to work with those field lines, we're going to manipulate them just as Snell manipulated his, his uh, rays of um, particles. And here's the way that we're going to do it. So suppose we have a field line, magnetic one, it doesn't matter, we've got a field line going here, it happens to go in a straight line. We don't like that, we want, to go to, we want it to go in a line like this. So we take from Einstein that if we could distort space, <coughs> we could actually um, pull it about like a bit of rubber until it had this distorted shape here. And the field line is embedded in that space, so as the space moves, so it carries with it this, this line of force. Um, and so you can imagine how you might distort a space and so control how the field lines move. Now Einstein gave us something else as well as a clue that you can distort <coughs> space. He said that if, if you do distort space, now you, you may think distorting space and bringing black holes is, is a bit of a clumsy way of actually engineering devices and so on. But there's a left out, because if you're only dealing with light, then Einstein said, well, it's okay, you don't have to introduce uh, a real metric here, because the refractive index is as good as the metric as far as light is concerned. So his formula for the metric, we can steal and use it to calculate the refractive index. Actually, what we calculate are epsilon and mu, the... Uh, permittivity and permeability, but they, they are the quantities which determine this refractive index here. Um, now, you, if you're all mathematical, you can go to Einstein and he will say, well, uh, this is uh, like a coordinate transformation. These two lattices <coughs> are related by a transformation. Uh, uh, this is the x coordinate and this is the x prime coordinate system. And if you take the derivative of that, you get a matrix. And this matrix acting on uh, this uh, quantity epsilon, a mu, the electrical and magnetic responses, gives you uh, the, the value of epsilon and mu, and therefore the refractive index you need to send these field lines in this direction here. So if you make a material with these properties, this is what it will do to the field lines. And that's where transformation optics comes from, because this can be thought of as a coordinate transformation, and from that you get the metric. Um, but there's an even simpler way of thinking about it, which I'll... Uh, uh, yes, I have time, so I'll go through that. Um, so let's make the simplest transformation we can. We're just going to take a bit of space and we're going to squash it like that. Okay. And if, if you do that, then... Um, by the way, this transformation also works for rays of light as, as well as field, so it, it sort of encompasses Snell's law as well. So, <coughs> a ray of light going along here in the uncrushed space, when you squash this central bit here, it will go in this side trajectory. And the question is, in order to do that, what values of epsilon and mu must be introduced here? And I'm going to do two thought experiments to determine that. I'm going to send a probe 
I'm going to send a, a ray of light uh, along this direction here. And I'm going to require that, uh, of course, light is a wave. You've got to acknowledge that. And the wave carries a phase which changes as it goes along at a rate which is determined by this quantity, the wave vector in free space. And so if the original thickness was d, the phase change is k0 d. Now, if you squash this region here, you've got to arrive at the far side in exactly the same conditions you did before, but over a shorter distance. And the way you, you do that is to compensate for the refractive index of that region here by changing its value of k by this factor of, of m here. Um, and in order to increase the refractive index, um, you must increase the values of epsilon and mu which the, the fields associated with this light see. And the fields associated with the light are normal to the direction of propagation. And so you've got to in increase the response for those. And so epsilon and mu, uh, the Maxwell's equations are symmetric in electric magnetic fields. So whatever you do to epsilon, you've got to do to mu. And so they increase by the inverse of the compression factor. So we know what epsilon and mu are in this plane. But uh, this is uh, an anisotropic medium because you've squashed it, and you still don't know what happens along the direction of propagation. And so you send light in along another direction, uh, uh, and this direction has not been squashed. And let's say we have the magnetic field uh, along here, an epsilon uh, along the original direction. So the magnetic field is here along the direction that squashing has taken place. And now, this beam should go through, this ray should go through with the same phase, because you've not squashed here. But it can't do that un unless you adjust something, because remember, you've made epsilon bigger here, so the phase will be greater. And to compensate for that, you've got to reduce the magnetic response along this direction. And you could do another experiment in which an electric field is aligned here, and you find the same result of the electric field. So parallel to the direction of squashing, epsilon and mu remain smaller. So the, the formula is very, very simple. That what you need to do is, when you squash a region of space, perpendicular to the direction of squashing, epsilon and mu are increased by a very simple factor, just the inverse of squashing. If you ask what epsilon mu are in long direction of squashing, they're reduced by the squashing factor. Increase, reduce. Very, very simple. So I could go back to this figure here. I could crawl over this squash coordinate system with a ruler and a protractor, and I could ask how much has been squashed in this direction, this direction, this direction, and how much has the cell been twisted, and I could just with the ruler and protractor discover what epsilon and mu were at every point here. And so I put it to you that we have um, retrieved much of the simplicity of Snell's law, that we, we know uh, that this coordinate system can move the field lights anywhere we want, and when we're done, we have an idea in our mind's eye exactly what that does to epsilon and mu. So we, we have these rules for uh, uh, controlling light. We, we can make a coordinate transformation and push the field lights where we want, and the transformation itself will tell us what sort of material we need to do that. There's one other nice little result, which, which uh, uh, I, I'll tell you. If you squash in this direction, you increase and you decrease. And if you squash in this direction by the same amount, you do the inverse. So what's in between doesn't change. So if you make what's called a conformal transformation in two dimensions, the material properties don't actually change. It's just the shape, shape that changes, not the shape, the dimensions. Uh, the shape mustn't change in a conformal transformation. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with a mother system and what, what we want to do is to achieve this objective of pushing light down to the nanoscale. Ideally, we want to 
push it all through a square nanometer. How can we do that? Well, we've got to take space and squash it like that. But first of all, we've got to start with a system that collects sunlight and puts it somewhere. And we don't care how it collects or where it pushes because we can fix that with our coordinate transformation. So we take a mother system, and the job of that mother system is, is that it's, it's just going to collect light. We'd like it to collect light over a range of frequencies, but it basically collects light, and um, it, it puts it somewhere. And if you choose your system right, it can be sufficiently simple that you can solve it analytically, um, but it may not have the right shape, and it may put the light in the wrong place. I become a little clearer when I show you the solar system you're looking at. And then you say, well, I don't like where the lights come from. I don't know where it, like where it's going to, but I can devise a coordinate transformation which will fix that and put the light in the right place into this little square nanometer. And then at the end of the day, I can ask uh, what material I need to do that. Uh, using transformation optics. And this transformation creates what I call daughter structures, which inherits all the fields from this uh, system here. Because all we've done with the material, the fields, is swash them and stretch them a little bit, and how much the core and the transformation itself will tell you. So now, from one understanding, one very simple structure, you can generate a whole family of structures that appear to be unrelated to the mother structure, but in fact inherit her DNA. Now the materials we use, we use to do this, I, I have to say a little bit about them. We use metals, typically silver. And they have uh, a, a rather unusual property. <coughs> in most materials which are insulators, like water or glass, if you put an electric field on, the electrons in that uh, glass or water move in the direction that the field pushes them. And so they have a positive permeability, a polarizability. But in a metal, things are different. If you push electrons in a metal, they go in the opposite direction. They oppose the cause producing them because a metal screens electrons. So uh, the, 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 the fields inside a metal, polarization fields in the opposite, opposite direction. And that's a consequence of the electrons in the metal being free. So if, if you give them a sharp push, they'll, they'll wobble around. Uh, they're what we call a plasma. Uh, and they behave very much like a, a, a liquid, a charged liquid, but they still behave like a liquid. And like ordinary liquids, uh, ordinary liquids have waves on their surface, and metals have waves on their surface. Uh, there are oscillations of the uh, charge density. I've drawn the pluses and minus the wrong way around, never mind. Um, and these waves, because they're not the light waves, they're charge density waves, uh, they can have a very short wavelength, down almost the wavelength of an electron, and certainly less than a nanometer. And it's the creation of these waves and the exploitation of the fact that you have a negative permit permittivity in, in metals that enables us to go through this transformation uh, scenario and get to the objects we, we want to. So we're going to use these metals, which naturally have these waves on the surface. And because they have charges on them, they interact with light, and you can create these waves by shining light on the metal. So what I'm going to do is to make a waveguide uh, made of a silver metal, and this has these surface plasmons on the surface, uh, and they um, interact with one another, and they can rush around the surface here. So if you have uh, an atom, here, oh, by the way, that the frequency of these surface plasmons is in the visible, generally speaking, the silver is in the visible. So if you put an atom here, which is an excited state, that atom can make a transition, and its energy can excite one of these surface plasmons. It can be harvested by the surface plasmon, and that energy will then wiggle off to infinity here, 
And if you're interested in technicalities, this is the frequency versus wave vector expression of a typical surface wave in this, this uh, uh, two-dimensional wave band to finite slant silver. But as I explained, that mother system is not much good at harvesting light. Yeah. Well, where's the nano, you might say? But, um, you know, what's the good of energy which is harvested but is kicked off to infinity? Don't worry, because there are transformations called inversions which take points at infinity and they bring them to the origin, and they take points at, in, uh, at the origin and they send them to infinity. And that's a very, very simple the most elementary transformation in two dimensions you can think of. If you think of z as a complex number, x plus i, y, and you make a transformation z prime is 1 upon z, then that's an inversion which sends points at infinity to the origin and the origin to infinity. And so what you get when you do that, this structure here, um, points at infinity all go to the origin, so that was what in was infinity before. And points of the origin, which I take the dipole, go to infinity. And that produces a uniform... So this dipole field is stretched out, so it becomes a, 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 an external electric field created somewhere at infinity. And that, just as this dipole excites this field here, this dipole excites the fields in this bit here, which acts a bit like an aerial. And the energy then propagates around here, which is it's just this transformed wave here. This wave goes to infinity. This wave goes to the origin. And it's a bit like a black hole. It's not really a black hole because it doesn't have Hawking radiation and all that stuff. But it, it's like a black hole in the sense that the energy travels to this point, but it never gets there because this energy never gets to infinity, and so this energy never gets to this point here. It just goes slower and slower. But along the way... It's, you've got to imagine a motorway, the car's going very quickly, and gradually they slow down, and the cars come closer together and more and more dense. And so the photons in this stream of energy go slower and slower, they get closer and closer, closer together, and the energy gets more dense, and also the wavelength gets crushed to a very short wavelength. So, oops. Yeah. So here's, here's a, a sort of plot of, of the uh, field density, um, and you can see that the field's weak here, but as it's being forced to this point here, it, its intensity rises very much. In fact, it goes off scale here. We, it gets so intense you can't really plot it with a color diagram. And you can also see that these oscillations get to very, very short wavelengths. I've drawn this, this other guy here because uh, that, that is... Um, uh, um, I missed, missed the slide out. Oops. Yeah. Well, there's a slide missing there. Never mind. Um, yes, yes, that's the one I wanted. So, the previous slide I show you in the inversion takes a crescent, but if you have this inverse waveguide, whereas now you've got the waveguide is a vacuum, but you've got bits of metal out the side, then inverting this, uh, believe me, gives two kissing cylinders which touch at this point and it has exactly the same properties of course it's inherited them from the mother it grabs energy here and it shoves it to this point here um, I think perhaps a more illuminating way of plotting that is, is this what we have here is the electric field intensity as a function of this angle here so you're going from the point which is you was in the original frame close to the dipole to a point here which is at infinity, and this angle goes from 0 to 180 degrees. So we look at the last bit from 174 to 180 degrees, where this is getting really, really thin, going very slow. So here's the field intensity. You can see the wavelength gets shorter and shorter. But also, note that this, this field strength in this structure here is normalized to what the field strength was before it hit this structure here. So that was unity out here. And now it's more than a thousand times stronger. Why doesn't it do what I said and grow, go on growing like this? And the reason is there's some loss in the silver. And as the wave goes slower and slower, it becomes more and more vulnerable to that loss. And this amplification 
this motorway effect of squashing the photons together loses out to the fact that you're losing photons like mad because you can't get past the loss fast enough. So eventually the process collapses. But before it does, the field intensity is a thousand times bigger. The energy density is the proportion of the field squared. The energy density is, is a million times greater. Okay? A million times greater. And this is our mechanism for harnessing light on the nanoscale. So if, if you take these singular structures, and I'll show you some more in a moment, you can gather light, harvest it, and you can push it down to dimensions here. And by the time you've got this cusp here, the, these, these guys are, are, are about, a nano, this, that's about a nanometer across, because you must, to get a factor of a million, you've got to decrease the area of the beam <coughs> from here <coughs> to here by a factor of a million, right? So you've done that uh, nanometric harvesting. Um, oh, this is just a plot of the uh, absorption cross-section, how much light is captured, and this is before the spheres touch. So what's doing this job is this singularity, and what I'm showing here is this is the uh, absorption as a function of frequency of an isolated cylinder, two isolated cylinders, a single uh, absorption peak. As you bring them close together, you get a whole series of resonances. And eventually, when they touch or kiss, these smear into one uh, uniform absorption band. What else have we here? OK. Um, now, there are some experiments done at Duke University uh, by David Smith's team in collaboration with the chemists there. And these are very, very difficult experiments because you're talking about uh, spheres here. Uh, it, this, this is a sphere, not a cylinder, but the same effects apply. And you're talking about spheres here, which are about 20 nanometers across. Now, it's drawn here as a beautiful circular sphere and a beautiful flat surface. But I just emphasize how difficult it is to grow back. Se semiconductors are easy peasy, and you've had you know, half a century of development of semiconductor technology to make beautifully flat semiconductor surfaces. You paid for that with your cell phones. Metals are different. Um, I suppose health and safety have never allowed you to play with mercury, but I think you might imagine that if you took a handful of mercury and you tried to grow a nice flat mercury surface on this bench by throwing the mercury down, you wouldn't succeed. And what would happen is the mercury would break out into a thousand droplets on the surface. And that's exactly what happens if you try to grow mercury on silicon. So the mercury has enormous surface tension. It likes nothing better than to go into a little ball. And what it does, if you grow it like that, is to make a very rough surface. But here, to do this experiment in which you assume the flat surface, you have to be very clever in your preparation of the gold surface and very clever in uh, constructing the nano nanosphere. And then you're not done, because you need to know the distance between the sphere and the surface very precisely. And that's where the chemistry comes in. Because these guys are specialists in making molecules which you can put down in a monomolecular layer. So you know exactly the thickness of that layer. It's the thickness of the molecule. What's more, you know if you can put one layer down and you can put two or three or four. So you can increase the spacing of a, a, a gold sphere resting on this surface by altering the number of layers of this special chemical which you, you, you put down here. And they did those experiments. They, they done even more sophisticated, sophisticated experiments uh, recently, but uh, these serve to illustrate the purpose. So here's the gap between the sphere and the uh, gold surface in nanometers. So we're down to two nanometers here. So that's, that's our sort of target dimension. And the way they, they tested the field enhancements was to do something called a surface enhanced Raman scattering experiment. And that, that's not as complicated as it sounds. All you do is shine light on the surface. And into that chemical layer, you introduce some molecules which have a very definite vibrational frequency. And the laser light can lose a quantum of energy to a quantum of vibration. So when it comes back, it has a shifted frequency, and you can detect that it has lost that energy to that molecule. 
and the cross-section for that scales as the fourth power of the enhancement of the field strength. So here's the Raman intensity, which is unity when the um, uh, when you have no enhancement due to the sphere, but if the sphere is brought closer, you see the enhancement climbs to more than 10,000. Now that's how people first realized that something very odd was going on at these, these singular metal surfaces. Anybody heard of Fleischmann? Who's Fleischmann? What did he do? Has anybody heard of cold fusion? Yeah, he did that. That's the wrong thing he did. The right thing he did was to discover this giant Raman resonance. So the Raman signal, this loss of energy to a, a photon, has a very, very small cross-section ordinarily because you have this big, fat photon. You have this tiny little molecule and they hardly talk to one another. So if you just put molecules on a gold surface and reflect light from it, you don't see anything. Uh, of course, the signal's not strong enough. But what Fleischmann noticed was that one day he did this, he was an electrochemist, and one day he, he did an experiment in which he didn't have a nice flat silver surface, it was rough. And he saw a signal a million times stronger than it should be. And it's due to these effects, as you have a rough surface, you have lots of singularities, little spheres touching one another, sharp points and so on. And all these singularities, I'll show you in a moment, do create these nanometric concentrations of, of light. And that experiment was done uh, more than a quarter of a century ago. It created a great sensation at the time, um, and uh, it, it wasn't known at the time what it was due to, because people didn't understand all this transformation optics stuff, and uh, they thought it was due to some chemistry. They were chemists, so they thought it was chemistry. But it turned out to be uh, just the enhancement of, of, of the fields. So our goal of bringing light down to the nanometer scale was in fact realized by accident all those years ago in these giant Raman resonance effects. But really what you want to do to bring it to a technique which the bioessayists can use to do things like testing for diseases, pregnancy testing and so on is another target application. To get it down to molecular sensitivity, you have to do it in a controlled environment. The Flashman's rough surface was a demonstrator, but we didn't know what the hell was going on there, so it wasn't useful as a quantitative tool. And certainly recently we can... Uh, uh, now, what I want to show in this slide is that um, this, this enhancement of, of the intensity has been seen in all sorts of structures, but they have one thing in common. They have a geometric singularity, and the singularity could be two spheres or two cylinders touching, a crescent where you have infinitely thinness here, or uh, a ball embedded in a surface with a sharp corner, or a knife edge, or a, a needle point. And all these show the enhancement, but they all have a common origin in this mother structure, which is a waveguide or a series of waveguides. And in each case, you can think of a mathematical transformation which takes this structure, the waveguide structure, into the singular structure. And all that you have to do is devise a transformation with a singularity in it that does this crushing operation that Einstein told us we could do and create these singularities. So a whole ranch of, uh, a whole tranche of structures and effects can be understood in terms of one structure. There's something else which I think is, well, I think is really beautiful, which maybe you do or do not. And it's this, that in, in, in physics, when we understand systems, symmetry is awfully important. So um, if light propagates in free space, free space is the same everywhere. And one consequence of that is when you solve the wave equation, you get the wave vector. So the wavelength stays constant as the light goes along. And that describes, uh, characterizes the light in terms of the wavelength or its inverse, which we call the wave vector. And in other sorts of symmetries, uh, you can also define uh, a characterizing quantity analogous to the wave vector. Now this waveguide here has translational symmetry. 
And so the solutions of Maxwell's equations in this waveguide are wave-like in nature with a constant wavelength. And, and that's a great... It does two things. One is that it enables you to calculate the wave very simply because you can throw away all the possible solutions which aren't waves and there's just one left and then you just want to know what the wavelength is. Maxwell will tell you. Uh, and in an asymmetrical structure, you don't have that luxury. But it also le le means that you can understand very simply the nature of that solution because it's just a simple wave. It's something simple because of the symmetry. So I'm banging on about symmetry, and the point I want now to make is that what happens with this transformation is that the transformation destroys the symmetry. So this has translational symmetry. The only symmetry this guy has is a mirror plane. And likewise this here. So you've hidden the symmetry. And I say hidden, you've not destroyed it. Because remember that this structure inherits <coughs> the solutions of this equation. All that they are, they're still waves, but they're distorted waves, but distorted in a way that you know and understand through this transformation. It's a very beautiful thing that a lot of these structures, which may look a complete mess and a singular, when you actually unravel them using transformation optics, you can take them back to a simple structure which you understand. So our understanding of these plasmonic harvesting systems have been hugely enhanced by transformation optics. There's one more fun thing I'd like to show you, and that is that um, <coughs> years ago, when I still worked in Cambridge, in the Cambridge, I had a very smart... Uh, a uh, research student from the Basque country is now quite a famous politician there. He was Minister of Science, actually, in the first Basque class government. And this is one calculation which he did uh, when he was working with me. And if you have an electron, uh, and Cambridge is famous for its electron microscopy, uh, in an electron microscope, when you send the electron parallel to the surface, this, this electron is, is like a boat driving over a sea and it will excite the surface plasmons here. So you, you, uh, you can calculate that effect, how much energy this electron uses to the, the surface plasmons. Um, so this subject is coming to life again recently, but with more complicated structures. So I asked myself, can we understand not only this very, very simple geometry here, but can we understand fancier structures. So what if we send an electron, not by a flat surface, but one of these singular structures here? And uh, we, we know uh, what the solutions of Maxwell's equations are like in this structure. They're just the transform solutions here. But what about the electron? So uh, it turns out that if you move an electron in a straight line here, and then you transform about this inversion point, and you get this solid then, yes what the electron does is go around in little circles. So you can calculate the electron field simply in this frame, because it's just going in a straight line at a constant velocity. And you calculate what the, the electric and magnetic fields are in this frame, because this is a simple waveguide, and you put the two together, and you have the excitation spectrum of this uh, structure here. And this, this is the loss spectrum, which you can measure by capturing the electron after it's gone by, and asking how much energy is lost, and this is the energy measured in electron volts that uh, 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 an electron would uh, lose um, at these various voltages, depending on how fast it was traveling as a fraction of the speed of light. And you see you have this very lovely uh, complex spectrum here. So there are lots of things which you look just a mess before, and people used to... Uh, beat to death with Maxwell's equations and you know, computer calculations which took hours because these singular structures are very, very difficult to solve even when you have a powerful computer. Now you can understand them uh, by analytic calculations but more importantly you can understand what the driving force is creating all these enhancements. Um, there's just one final thing I'd like, I can't resist telling you because I think this is really the neatest thing which uh, we've done with with these um, <coughs> understanding <coughs> structures with transformation optics. So years ago, there was a guy called Vesselago, and he asked the question, what would happen if you had a material where Snell's law encountered a refractive index which was less than zero, which was negative? 
So that would imply that in contrast to normal refraction, where the refracted ray always appears on this side of the normal, and therefore that's what Snell meant by a positive angle, so this will give a positive air like glass or water. And in contrast, he asked what would happen if you had a material where, where the light went this way instead of that way. And so according to Snell, that would have a negative refractive index. And he uh, gave us a prescription for that. He said in order to have a negative refractive index, what you must do is you must make both the electric and magnetic response negative. And when you're done, because those two guys determine the refractive index, you'll have this material here. There's a whole talk I could give on negative refractive index indices, but I'd just like to point out one really neat thing that, that you get by thinking about it that way. Um, now, w when you just say there's a negative refractive index, you... well. I didn't hear a gasp or anything like, maybe like unless you fell asleep or something. <laughs> uh, so on the surface of it, it's not surprising, but I'll take you back to Einstein. And what Einstein said was that in Maxwell's equations, the refractive index is, is just the same as changing the metric, which measures how much you squash space. So, and I also say to you that I can tell you what the consequences of quashing space is. So, I, I'm going to squash some space, all right, and remember that if light's going this way, I'm going to increase epsilon and mu, so I'm going to increase the refractive index, and that's what squashing space says, that if I squash space, I increase its refractive index because I've increased the metric. So, I'm going to squash and the refractive index just gets bigger and bigger and more positive. You think, oh, well, that's headed in the wrong direction. But if you've seen these singular functions, now, if, if you can imagine the plot of 1 upon x in your mind, you have 1 upon x, and as you come from positive x to the origin, it gets very, very big. But what does it do then? As soon as you go through the origin, it goes very, very small, very, very negative, and then it's negative thereafter. And that's exactly what the metric does. It goes to a singular point, and then when you squash the space a bit more, you create a negative refractive index. And so this middle region has been sort of over-squashed, and it has this negative refractive effect. But something else has happened. You pay a price. And the price is, you've done something really horrible to space, right? You really mix it up because this is a space which isn't single value. It's a space with three manifolds. And that is the beginning of another story, which I shan't tell tonight because I'll finish in a more minute, uh, which is a story that if you focus light here and then the light goes here and turns back and retraces its step, it will focus a second time and then. It retraces its steps again, so there are three manifolds, three foci, and that's a conclusion reached with Maxwell's equation. So each of those foci is perfect. Abbey's law doesn't apply. Providing that you can have access to material with a <coughs> refractive index. So uh, in 2000, I published a paper which, which said that if you can get a refractive index, it's exactly the right refractive index, which is negative, then you can make a lens whose resolution is unlimited by Abbey's law. Uh, that's a another story, perhaps, for another time. But I hope I've shown you that this, this subject, which is inspired by those three great men from the past, from the long past, uh, has, has really brought, uh, all these years afterwards, new insights into experiments which uh, we we're doing today which are enabling us to squash light down from the micron level down into a square nanometers and all sorts of possibilities await us when we come to exploit that. So thank you very much for your attention.